So PA does not work like the rest of the, of the mediators of inflammation. It does not increase with inflammation. It decreases with inflammation. That's a very, very important thing. This is in healthy tissue, a lot of PA. In inflammation and in, uh, in, uh, in painful states, look, PA is much less. I told you that, right? Why? Well, because the enzyme that makes it, NAPLD, goes down. The expression of this enzyme, we say, the transcription is downregulated. And the expression of the enzyme that makes, the, that destroys PA, making palmitic acid, is increased. So it's a double whammy. The um, less production, more degradation, less PA. So who cares? We do. We should care. Because if inflammation and tissue damage lower PA production, then by replacing the PA that we have lost in inflammation, we will have an analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect. So administration of exogenous PA can offset this deficit. So we are giving a vitamin to a tissue that suffers from hypovitaminosis. That is a very important concept. It's not the same thing as giving a drug, it's restoring a normal level of an endogenous anti-inflammatory agent, an analgesic agent. So does it really work in humans? I only show you data from rats, mice, and, uh, and stuff like that. It does. PEA, they concluded, may be a useful treatment for pain and is generally well tolerated. That's a very important initial, initial clinical uh, um, support uh, of the idea that PEA is an endogenous anti uh, um, uh, analgesic and anti-inflammatory compound. Now, of course, the authors also conclude that more studies are needed, and that's clearly, uh, clearly always the case. So acute inflammation is the type of inflammation which we have whenever our body is subjected to some kind of harmful stimulus, for example, a frostbite, for example, a cut, a little infection causes inflammation. It's a very protective response. We need inflammation. If we did not have an inflammation, we would die. That is acute inflammation, and usually acute inflammation is rarely treated, pharmacologically treated. I mean, if you have an allergic reaction, maybe you take an antihistamine, but in most cases for these things, unless they're very, very serious, you don't really go for a full treatment. I mean, maybe certainly an infection you do, but you typically don't treat the inflammation. For example, for an infection, you treat the infection, right? You take an antibiotic. You don't try and block the, the inflammation because the inflammation is a response to the, to the arrival of the bacteria, right? So this is something that also can happen in a lot of normal situations that are not really pathological. Uh, Venkatesh was referring before to what happens when you run, you know, if you're, a, if you're an athlete and you run uh, or you, you know, exert your muscles excessively, then you have lactate, myoglobin release. Those are all things that, are, that uh, occur normally. They're not considered diseases, they're not pathological. Still, they can be harmful, right, hurtful. So that's acute inflammation and is very useful in survival. What about chronic inflammation? This is where scientists are baffled. We do not know how an acute inflammation converts, transforms itself into a chronic inflammatory condition where there is no more reason for the body to be inflamed. There is no more reason for that. There are no bacteria, there are no viruses. It's just a process that is self-generating, self-regenerating process. And it's at the basis of almost every important disorder that we have. Cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. These are huge conditions. And of course, cancer. So chronic inflammation is, I think Time Magazine once called it, the silent killer. Now, what does PA do in this context? Well, what we know is that PA, particularly in chronic inflammatory conditions, and this has been shown in human tissue, is lower, just like I told you, just like I told you. The enzyme that makes it goes down, the enzyme that destroys it goes up, PA levels drop. In allergic reactions, rheumatoid arthritis, and neurological diseases. And of course, we need more data, we need more conditions, we need to understand this better, but this is where we are right now. So if this is the case, what this suggests is that, of course, if we, uh, therapeutic agents that for chronic inflammation should find ways of raising the levels of PEA, for example, PEA itself, or agents that raise it through some other mechanism. 
For example, my lab is interested in developing inhibitors for the enzyme that destroys PEA, and those inhibitors are very good at increasing the levels of PEA. But this is a drug. What about instead healthy living? And that's where I think you know, my colleagues at Levagen come with Levagen and uh, Ginkor come in, uh, in, in, uh, in, into play. What they're, what they're asking is the question is whether in conditions that are not yet pathological, PEA could be also effective. And they are show, they've just shown some very convincing data that this might be the case. So I, I will stop this by saying that, of course, we need more studies because this is despite the fact that 50 years, uh, PA was discovered more than 70 years ago, uh, actually no, more, about 60 years ago in 57, um, we still need to understand in greater detail how it works in healthy people as well as in people with chronic inflammation or with chronic pain. Um, but the data we have so far are really encouraging. So I'd like to stop here and just as a disclosure say that my studies are supported by the National Institutes of Health and by the Department of Defense by and large. We also received a generous gift from Gene Corps. And I'll stop here and take any questions if we have time. I think we do have